Welcome back to Biomechanics on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing uh, the biomechanics of rolling, more specifically starting in a supine position and then rolling into side lying on one side. So we'll talk about the normal major muscles that are involved and what might happen or what you might see in an individual following a stroke who has hemiplegia on one side. Okay, so the first muscle that's majorly involved in rolling from supine to sideline is the sternocleidomastoid. So in this, I'm going to review a little bit of anatomy of this muscle because in many cases it can help us explain how this muscle is involved in rolling. So this muscle originates on the manubrium of the sternum in the medial part of the clavicle. You can actually see that right here. So over here more medially this is actually the sternal head of sternocleidomastoid. This is the clavicular head right here. You can see both uh, heads are going to fuse into one uh, larger muscle belly superiorly and they're going to insert on the mastoid process. Now bilaterally, if both sternocleidomastoids contract at the same time, it's going to give you cervical flexion. However, uh, individually, the sternocleidomastoids also facilitate ipsilateral lateral flexion and contralateral rotation. Okay? In other words, if the left sternocleidomastoid contracts, it can promote left lateral flexion or right rotation of the neck. Okay. Uh, now one of the things that's important to understand is generally speaking in most cases of hemiplegia following stroke uh, it's actually not common to see weakness or impaired activation of the sternocleidomastoid. This is the rarest one. The other three are going to be very common uh, but there are some cases where this can be weak and other conditions where you can have weak sternocleidomastoids. But in those individuals who have weak sternocleidomastoids, when they roll from supine into sideline, the head's probably going to be excessively extended and possibly rotated the wrong way due to gravity. Now one way to imagine this is either imagine this person with their head hanging off the bed, or you could actually get in supine um, with your head potentially dang dangling off the edge of the bed and hold your neck up or head up like this. Okay, If your head is off the edge of the bed and you expect to keep your head in this position, your sternocleidomastoids are going to have to contract. So if they're doing a concentric contraction, they will be doing cervical flexion, uh, but they can also contract isometrically to hold the head up like this. Okay? If you completely relax your sternocleidomastoids, what happens? Your head's going to fall off the edge of the bed. It'll just dangle off the edge. Okay, so if I have weakness in my sternocleidomastoids, um, when I start to roll, I'm not going to be able to support my head up like this, whether it be isometrically or concentrically. And so it's just going to fall back or it's going to stay down. And so as I start to rotate my torso over, I'm going to see extension or excessive extension in the neck. Let's see what this might look like. I'll first show you the normal rolling pattern. Now I'm going to use my left lower extremity to kind of push off, but what I want you to notice is that as my, the, my left half of my torso comes off and I roll onto my right side, notice that my occiput is going to come off of the ground. Okay, the back of my skull is going to come off of the ground, and the only way that I'm going to be able to support my head is if my sternocleidomastoids are functioning properly. So I'm going to push off, I'm going to roll over, and as my torso comes off, because I have functional sternocleidomastoids, I'm able to support my head as it comes off of the ground. Now let's see what happens if my sternocleidomastoids are weak. So I'm going to initiate the same rolling pattern. I'm going to use my left lower extremity to push off and roll. You don't have to do that. But watch what happens as my left torso comes up off the ground. And as I'm rolling onto my right, if my sternocleidomastoid is weak, my occiput is going to stay on the ground because I'm not able to support the head as it would normally want to come off the ground. And so when this occurs, I'm going to be put in excessive extension. Look at that. My occiput is still on the ground because my sternocleidomastoids are weak. I'm not able to bring the head off. There might be a little bit of movement of the head off of the ground just because there's limitations in the length of muscles and tendons and ligaments and all that. Okay, but it's staying there with excessive extension. The next muscle that's going to be important here is the pectoralis major. Here's the left one. Here's the right one. Now in the video, I'm going to be rolling onto my right side. 
Now, let's again review some of the origins and insertions here. So the origins of pectoralis major depends on which head we're talking about. This head up here originates on the clavicle, uh, really the anteromedial clavicle, and then this larger one, the sternocostal head, originates on the anterior sternum, the upper six costal cartilages, which are actually deep origins, and also down here we would also have the external oblique upon neurosis. Now when we think of lateral flexion or horizontal adduction, same thing, but we can think of this movement in two ways. And the typical one that most people think about is this first one. This is what you might do in the gym if you're performing dumbbell flies or pectoral flies. Basically what you're doing is you're actually pulling the humerus medially toward the midline in the transverse plane. Okay, so really your torso is static and then your humerus is moving toward the midline in the transverse or horizontal plane. However, the pectoralis major can function in another way. Because in this first method, the torso is static and the arm is mobile. But what happens if the arm is static and the torso is mobile? Meaning, the arm's not really moving. Same thing with the shoulder girdle. And then we're actually going to have the torso move toward the arm. That second one's actually what's going to be happening during rolling. So we're really going to have one arm planted on the ground, and then the torso is going to be pulled toward that arm. So we're pulling the torso toward a static humerus and static shoulder girdle. Okay, And so when we look at this, when a person rolls onto one side, the act of pectoralis major is actually the one on the side that you're rolling onto. So if I'm rolling onto my right side, as I will be in the video, it's actually my right pectoralis major that's more active. And sometimes it's a little unintuitive because we think the other one would be active to pull that arm over. And maybe to some extent it is. But most of the activity is actually on the side that you're rolling onto. So keep in mind, we're going to be pulling the torso toward a stable or static humerus. Let's see what that might look like. So first, let's look at a normal pattern right here. Okay, So I'm still going to use my left lower extremity to push off. I don't have to do that. But watch, I'm going to be rolling onto my right side right here, and my torso is going to be moving toward that right humerus. Notice that the arm and shoulder girdle are planted on the ground. So this is what normal is going to look like. Okay, I'm rolling my torso and bringing my sternum, so to speak, closer to that right arm. So that's my right pectoralis major. What would this look like if it were pathological? So I have weakness in the right pectoralis major. Well, notice I'm going to try to roll here, uh, but I'm not really able to bring my left torso over to the right side because the right pectoralis major isn't functioning. It's weak. So I'm not able to bring the sternum toward my right arm. Okay, so just watch that. I'm not really able to get it over there. I might try to reach with this arm to grab something to pull myself over, but I'm having trouble bringing the left half of my torso toward my right. And that's because of a deficiency or weakness in this right pectoralis major. So hopefully that makes sense. One of the things you might see in individuals who have this, they'll try to reach maybe with this arm to grab onto something or even push off further with their lower extremities. The third muscle that's important is the external abdominal oblique. So this muscle is going to originate on the lower ribs, ribs 5 through 12 actually. In fact, the muscular part you can actually see starting here, rib 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way down through the lowest rib. And it's going to insert on a variety of structures, including the xiphoid process, iliac crest, the inguinal ligament, pubic crest and the pubic tubercle, and also the anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS. And because of this, its action is going to be spinal rotation. Now, there's two ways to think about this. Either you can think about the way you do it in standing or sitting, which is where you'd rotate the spine relative to a static pelvis. Okay, So the spine is mobile, the pelvis is static. In other words, if you stand up and rotate left, rotate right, okay, notice your pelvis isn't moving that much. Okay, it moves a little bit, but overall what's moving is your torso. That's not what happens during rolling. When we roll, uh, more or less uh, the pelvis is actually what is meant to move, and the torso is relatively static. Now, of course, the torso is not completely static, okay? It's just that the pelvis is more mobile here. 
if we're going to roll, we need to bring the contralateral pelvis over. So if I'm rolling onto my right side, as I will in the video, I need to bring my left hemipelvis over to that side. And so if I'm rolling onto my right, it's going to be the left external obliques that are going to be important. And so if you have weakness in the external obliques, um, you're going to see the pelvis trail when you roll onto the opposite side. Okay, So we're going to see a normal pattern first, and then we're going to look at what happens if my uh, contralateral external obliques are weak. So first, let's look at a normal pattern here. Okay, I'm going to be using my sternocleidomastoids, my ipsilateral or right pectoralis major, and then you'll see my left ASIS, my left pelvis, come over. Let's take a look at that. So my left pelvis comes over like that. And when you get into sideline, really the left hip uh, should be facing up. Notice what's going to happen when I start to roll, I'm not going to be able to get the left half of my pelvis over all the way. Notice that. I have my torso over, but if my left external oblique is weak, then my left pelvis is going to trail and it's not going to be able to get up all the way. And I'm not going to be able to get my lower extremities over very easily. Because remember, um, if, this were, if this external oblique were perfectly functional, I should end in sideline with my left hip facing directly up. Clearly the left half of the pelvis or left hemipelvis is trailing and that's because my left external oblique is weak there. The last muscle that's important here is really the rectus femoris, which is one of our four quadricep muscles, but here it's functioning as a hip flexor. So its origin is the AIIS, or the anterior inferior iliac spine. It does have some origin on the acetabular rim. And then it extends downward, and it's going to insert on the tibial tuberosity of the tibia uh, via, that should say, the quadriceps tendon and the patellar tendon, also called the patellar ligament. And here, its action is going to be hip flexion. Again, it does function as a knee extensor, but here we're thinking of it in, as its action as a hip flexor. Okay. Now, the action of the rectus femoris is really going to occur with the action of the external oblique. So when the external oblique contracts to move the pelvis over, really the rectus femoris has to contract to help flex the hip and move that lower extremity over as well. So in a typical rolling pattern to the right, the left rectus femoris is necessary to flex the left hip. So it's the contralateral rectus femoris, and it'll move the left lower extremity over to the right side, so in the direction of the roll. Okay, and like I mentioned, full movement of that left lower extremity to the right side, in other words, the roll to the right, is accomplished in conjunction with left pelvic rotation, also to the right side in the direction of the roll. And so if the rectus femoris is weak, then what you're going to see is the lower extremity is going to trail behind the pelvis. The pelvis will move just fine. It may be restricted a little bit just because the lower extremity will be restricted, um, but you'll actually see the left leg when I'm rolling out to the right lagging behind. So here's a normal pattern. Again, notice my left external obliques working, so my hip when I end in side lines facing up, and I clearly have some hip flexion there on the left because my left lower extremity has come over. Okay? And sometimes uh, people actually bring it even further over. Okay? Clearly there's hip flexion there on the left side. Let's see what happens when the rectus femoris on the left is weak. So in this case, everything's going to work except that left rectus femoris. Notice the pelvis is coming up, right? It may not get up all the way, but that's not necessarily a problem with the external oblique. Of course, the pelvis is connected to the lower extremity. So if the lower extremity can't make it up all the way or make it over because of impaired hip flexion, then the pelvis may be restricted just a little bit. But that doesn't mean that the external oblique is weak. And so notice my left lower extremity is not making it all the way. Okay, That's because potentially the rectus femoris is weak. And so we're not getting that hip flexion. Now, there's obviously a lot more muscles involved with rolling from supine to sideline, but these four were found to be very important by EMG, especially because they tend to be affected in individuals who have a stroke. So we have to have appropriate strength in the sternocleidomastoids, ipsilateral pectoralis major, contralateral external oblique, and the contralateral rectus femoris. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the biomechanics of rolling from supine to sideline. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.